Now you have a car. Welcome back. This is uh, the narration of James Bonwick's Irish Truths and Old Irish Religions. Uh, this was written in 1980, or 1894, at a time when the Celtic Empire in Ireland was at its infancy stages. Now, uh, the chapters covered are Irish bards and also a small bit on the Druids of the Isle of Man. Gormagla. Irish bards. The bards proper occupied a high position in Ireland. The Olives had colleges at Clover, Armagh, Lismore and Tamar. On this, Walker's Historical Memoirs of 19, 1786 observes that all the eminent schools delectably situated, which were established by Christian clergy in the 5th century, were erected on the ruins of these colleges. They studied for 12 years again in the Bard Gap and title of Olive, our teacher. They were the Olive on Redon, or Philly, poets. They acted as heralds, knowing the genealogy of their chiefs. With white robe, harp in hand, they encouraged warriors in battle. Their power of satire was dreaded and their praise desired. There is a story of the Ord Olov, or Arch Druid, sending to Italy for a book of skins containing various chills and compositions. And as the Kulmun and Company. As heralds, they were called Shanakees. As bards, they sang in a hundred different kinds of verse. One Olaf Fulla was the Solon of Ireland. Arigen, the singer, lived 500 BCE, roughly. Clorna Egas was last of the pagan bards. Long after they were, they were patriots of the tribes. With uncouth harps in many coloured vests, their matted hair with bows fantastic crowned. The statutes of Kilkenny by Edward III made a penal to entertain any Irish bard, but monster bards continued to hold their annual sessions in the early part of the last century. Caroline, the old blind harper and last of bards, died in 1738. Bards sang in the Hall of Shells, shells being in the cups. There were hereditary bards such as the O'Shields, the O'Canvans, and company paid to sing the deeds of family heroes, a lament for the land rang. A fine host and brave was he, master and governor, Ula Ulalu. We trice fifty bars, we confessed him chief in song and war, Ula Ulalu. In the far famed Trinity College Library is the dialogue of two sages in the Irish Fenian dialect, given the qualifications of a true olive. Among the famous bards were Lucker, acute poet, druid of Maeve, Ullal, king of Munster, O'Sheen, son of Cormac, king of Tara, now nearly unintelligible to Irish readers, Fergus Finwell of the Din Shankas, O'Sheen, the Fenian singer, Larer, whose poem was the son was famous, Lua, whose poem of the death of his wife fall of the great antiquity, Anna, once the chief poet of Ireland, Quarrua, a Finian and company, Fergus Fenviol, Bare Lips was a Finian bard. Ireland's Mirror, 1804, speaks of Hennessy as a living seer, as the Orpheus of his country. Amazon, brother of Heber, was the earliest of Milesian poets. Sir Philip Sidney praised the Irish bards three centuries ago. One in Munster stopped by his power the corn's growth and the satire of another caused the shortness of life. Such rhymes were not to be patronised by the Anglo-Normans. In the statute of 1367, one bard directed his harp, a shell of a wine, and his ancestors to shield be buried with him. In Rhapsody, some would see the images coming events pass before them and declare them in song. Who surely useful who rhymes susceptible rats to death. The Irish war odes were called Rosgaha, the Eye of Battle. Was it for such songs that the Irish Danes were cruel to bards? O'Reilly had a chronological account of 400 Irish writers. As Frau truly remarks, each celebrated minstrel sang his stories in his own way, adding to them, shaping them, colouring them, as suited his particular genius. It was Hieron who said of the early Greek bards, the gift of song came to them from the gods. Bill Marke, 
held the Irish Bards were really the historians of the race. Walker's Irish Bards affirms that the order of the Bards continued for many succeeding ages invariably the same. Even Buchanan found many of their ancient customs yet remain, yea, there is almost nothing changed in them in Ireland, but only ceremonies and rites of religion. Borlast wrote, The last place we read of them in the British Dominions is Ireland. Blair added, Long after the Order of the Druids was extinct and the national religion changed, the Bards continued to flourish, exercising the same functions as in Olden Ireland. But Walker claimed in the Fingalians as originally Irish. So I. Ferguson, in his Lays of the Western Gale, says, The extraction of the Bards were so intolerable that the early Irish more than once endeavoured to rid themselves of the Order. Their arrogance has procured their occasional banishment. Higgins, in Celtic Druids, had no exalted opinion of them, saying the Irish histories had been most of them filled with lies and nonsense by their bards. Assuredly, a great portion of their works were destroyed by the priests, as they had been in England, France, Germany, and so on. The harp corned bead was common in the 7th century. St. Columba played upon the harp. Bacor says that first James of Scotland, on the harp he excelled the Irish or the Highland Scots, who were esteemed the best performance in that instrument. Ireland was a school of music for Welsh and Scotch. Irish harpers were the most celebrated up until the last century. Ledwich thought the harp came from the Saxons and the Danes. The Britons, some say, had it from the Romans. The old German harp had 18 strings, the old Irish 28, the modern Irish 33. Henry VIII gave Ireland a harp for armoral bearing, being the great admirer of Irish music, but James I quartered with the arms of France and England. St. Bernard gives Archbishop Malachy, 1134, the credit of introducing music to the church service of Ireland. The Irish Crude was the Welsh Crude, or Crit, I'm butchering that, so apologies again to Welsh listeners. He wrote, relates, that a certain string was selected as the most suitable for each song. Theodorus Siclus recorded that the bards of the Gaul sang to instruments like lyres. The crotals were not bardic, but bell symbols of the church. There were hollow spheres holding loose bits of metal were rattling and connected by a visible shank. The corn was a metallic horn. The drum or tympan was a tabor. The pibmela or bagpipes were borrowed from the Far East. The bellows of the bag there, thereof were not seen until the 16th century. The Irish used um, four or whole tones and four biog or semitones. The core or harmony was Crucic, treble, and chronon bass. The names of chiefs were from the Latin. In most ancient languages, the same word is used for bard and sage. Lonrot found not a parish amongst the Carlians without several bards. Quafeg speaks of bardic contests thus. The two bards start stroke after stroke, each repeating at first what each the other had said. The song only stops when the learning of one of those two. Walker ungallantly wrote, We cannot find that the Irish had female bards, while admitting that females cried the Queen over the dead. Yet, in Colum, we read, The daughter of Moran seized the harp and her voice of music praised the strangers. Her souls melted at the song like the wreath of snow before the eye of the sun. The court bards were required, says Dr. Ardunavan, to have already seven times fifty chief stories, but twice fifty sub stories. To repeat before the Irish king and his chiefs. Conor MacNassa, king of Ulster, had 3,000 bards gathered from prosecuting neighbouring chiefs. Musician Harold Bard, thrice mayst thou be renowned, and with three several wreaths immortality be crowned. Brands, or Brown, were legislative bards, and said Walker in 1786 they were promo- prom- uh, sorry, promogulated the laws in a kind of recitative and or monotonous chant, seated in eminence in the open air. According to McCurtain, the Irish bars of the 6th century were long-flowing garments fringed and or, or, ornamented with needlework. In A Life of Columba, 1827, it is written, The bards and Shanachies retained their office, and some degree of the former estimation amongst nobility of Caledonia in Ireland, 
till the accession of the House of Hanover. Nothing can prove, says O'Byrne Crow, the late introduction of Druidism into our country more satisfactorily than the utter contempt in which the name Bard is held in all our records. After the introduction of our irregular system of Druidism, which must have been about the second century of the Christian era, the Flea had to fall in something like the position of the British Bards. Hence, we see them down to a late period, practicing incantations like the Magi of the continent and in religious matters holding extensive sway. Oceanic literature had a higher opinion of the bards, as such were the words of the bards in the days of song, when the king heard the music of harps and the tales of the old other times. The chiefs gathered from all their hills and heard the lovely sound. They praised the voice of Kona, the first among the thousand bards. Again, sit thou on the heat, O bard, and let us hear thy voice. It is a pleasant as the gale of spring that sighs in the hunter's ear when he awakens from dreams of joy and has heard the music of the spirits of the hill. Music of Cardell was like memory joys that are past pleasant and mournful to the soul. The ghosts of departed bars heard it. My life, exclaimed Fingal, shall be one stream of light of bars of other times. Tamor uh, cried, Loose the bars, their voice shall be heard in another age, when the kings of Timona have failed. Keating, amusingly credulous as an Irish historian, records with gravity the story of which ancient militia remembering 9,000 in times of peace, had bought sergeants and colonels into the rank of the Fina Aaron. No one was admitted unless proved to be a poetical genius, well acquainted with the 12 books of poetry. The Dinschenkus has poems by the Irish bard of the second century, Finn MacLuckna, and asserts that the people deemed each other's voices sweeter than the warblings of the melodious harp. On Tullin's authority, we learned that, after a long time after the English conquest, the judges, bards, physicians, and harpers held land tenures in Ireland. The O'Duvigans du were hereditary bards of the O'Kellys. The O'Shields were hereditary doctors. The O'Bordons, hereditary antiquaries, and the Maglancies, hereditary judges. The bards were Strabo's hymn makers. Mrs. Bryant felt that the Isle of Song was soon to become the Isle of Saints. I considered Ireland of the Bards knew is true simply as men skilled in all magical arts, having no marked relation either to a system of theology or to a scheme of ceremonial practice. The Brehan Law gives little information respecting Druids, though the Brehans were assumed to have been originally Druid judges. Patrick has the credit of compiling this record. These Brehans had a high reputation for justice and yet it confessed that it was one tempted to pass the false sentence, his chain of office would be immediately tightened around his neck, most uncomfortably as a warning. Of the Brehans, it is said by the editors, Omani and Ritchie, the learning of the Brehans became as useless to the public as the most fantastic discussions of the schoolmen, and the whole system crystallised into a form which rendered social progress impossible. Though those old Irish laws were so oppressive to the common people and so favourably to the hereditary chiefs, it was hard indeed to get the people to relinquish them for English laws. In 1522, English law existed in only four of the Irish counties, and Brehans and Olives were known to the end of the 17th century. The founding of the Book of Brehan Law is thus explained. And when the men of Aaron heard all the power of Partridge since his arrival in Aaron, they bowed themselves down in obedience to the will of God and Partridge. It was then that all the professors of the sciences in Aaron were assembled, and each of them exhibited his art before Partridge in the presence of every chief in Aaron. What did not clash with the word of God in the written law and in the New Testament, and with the consciences of the believers, was confirmed in the laws Bretons by Partridge, and by the ecclesiastics and the chieftains of Aaron. Isle of Man Druidism. The Isle of Man lies just between Ireland and Wales. Let us examine what can be shown in these matters therein. Boethius, translated by Alfred the Great, had a particularly doubtful story to tell, too similar, alas, to the narratives of early Christian writers. Cratilinus, the Scottish king, CE 277, said he, was very earnest in the overthrow of Druidism in the Isle of Man and elsewhere and upon the occasion of Diocletian's persecution, when many Christians fled him to him for refuge, he gave them the Isle of Man for their residence. He relates that Manan Beg, or Beog, 
was the establisher and cultivator of religion after the manner of the Egyptians. He caused great stones to be placed in the form of a circle. Train, in his History of Man, refers to Manenbeg, or Machilir, of the first century, having kept the island under mist by his necromancy. If he dreaded an enemy, he would cause one man to seem a hundred, and that by art magic. King Finnan, 134 BCE, is said to have first established Druze there. The Arch Druze was known as Coindra or Ardrua. Cowden thought the Druze emigrated thither after the slaughter of at Mona. Others declared Mona to have been an Irish Druidical settlement. Sachaburl refers to Druidical cairns on the tops of hills which were dedicated to the sun and speaks of hymns having what were called cairn tunes. <coughs> Train says, So highly were the Manx Druids distinguished for their knowledge of astronomy, astrology and natural philosophy that the kings of Scotland sent their sons to be educated there. He taught that until 1417, in limitation of the practice of Druids, the laws of the island were locked up on the breasts of the Deemsters. The old rude edifices of stone <coughs> are still called Tin and Drunup or Druids' houses. MacAlpine says that the Druid in Manx is 